Good afternoon, and thank you for joining us for today's roundtable discussion, our call to care more than allies. My name is Andrew Steele, and I serve as the Vice President for Development and Outreach here at Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service. And we are so happy that you've joined us and our special guests for this important discussion. A few housekeeping items before we get started. This session will be recorded and circulated after the event, and we encourage you to share it throughout your networks. We're also live streaming on Facebook right now. There will be a brief question and answer section towards the end of our program. Please, at any point, feel free to submit your questions via our Zoom Q&A box at the bottom of your screens, as well as through Facebook. Simply comment your question there. And a final note, this will be one of LRS's many advocacy efforts in the coming months. I hope you'll continue to stay engaged. You can do so through our social media pages on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram at the handle at LIRS.org, as well as through our website, www.lirs.org. And now I'd like to turn the conversation over to LIRS President and CEO, Krish Omera Vignaraj. Thanks so much, Andrew. Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Krish Omera Vignaraja, and I am President and CEO of Lutheran Immigration and Refugee Service. For those of you who aren't familiar with us, LIRS is the largest faith-based national nonprofit dedicated to immigrants and refugees. We began our work of welcome back in 1939 when LIRS was founded during the Second World War to assist the resettlement of Lutherans persecuted by the Nazi regime. But that mission quickly expanded and we have since responded to every major immigration crisis from the Cuban refugee airlift in the fall of Saigon to ethnic cleansing in the Balkans and the lost boys and girls of Sudan. Our work of welcome has extended over more than eight decades. And during that time, we've supported and empowered more than half a million immigrants. Throughout our history, LIRS has recognized and honored those who put their lives at risk in support of the US mission. We've resettled more than 11,000 Iraqi and Afghan wartime allies through the Special Immigrant Visa or SIB program. Since 2002, the US government has employed numerous Afghans to serve alongside US troops, diplomats, and other government employees as interpreters, cultural advisors, drivers, security guards, and other vitally important support staff. Through their work, these allies have saved countless American lives, often at great risk to themselves, in return, we promised we would not turn our back on them. The SIB program was created to help us keep that promise. But almost from the start, there has been a major backlog in SIB processing, leaving Afghans who worked alongside the US to wait several years before being accepted and cleared for travel. And now our Afghan allies need our urgent support. The Biden administration's withdrawal of troops from Afghanistan puts the lives of more than 17,000 Afghans who've stood beside the United States at grave risk, as well as more than 53,000 family members they cannot leave behind. Today, we are not only called to care, we're called to keep our promises. That's why LRS is calling upon the Biden administration to immediately evacuate our Afghan allies and their families. You'll hear more about this urgent call during our roundtable discussion. So let's get started. Today, I'm joined by my LIRS colleagues, Lee Williams, our Vice President for Programs, and Manager of Advocacy, Susanna Cunningham, as well as our special guest, Matt Zeller, a returned American vet who has gone on to become a public advocate for rethinking national security by protecting those who have protected us. He is a Truman Project Fellow an adjunct fellow at the American Security Project and the author of Watches Without Time, an American soldier in Afghanistan, an autobiography of his time serving in Afghanistan. Matt, welcome. Thanks for having me. Wonderful to have you and great to see you. Um, so Matt, I'm actually gonna start with you. Can you tell us about your relationship with an Afghan interpreter and how he kept you safe while abroad. I know you've talked about this in the past. Sure. Um, the only reason I'm sitting here alive talking to you today is because of that interpreter. His name is Janice. Uh, we met on my uh, fourth day in country 
uh, when I got to my little outpost, we met in receiving line, said, hi, looking forward to working with you and went on to the next person in line. Uh, 10 days after that, he would save my life in a battle in which he killed two Taliban fighters who were about to kill me. Um, from that point on, we were essentially connected at the hip. I, I didn't go anywhere in Afghanistan without him next to me because what I recognized was in addition to being my guardian angel, he was also um, our cultural bridge to the world around us. You know, there is a reason why the Taliban would target these people first in firefights is because they understood that without them, we couldn't do our jobs. And so when it came time for me to come home from the war, I told him that I owed him a life debt and that all he had to do, ever do is ask um, and I would do whatever it took to repay it. Uh, three months after I got back from the war, uh, in 2009, he let me know that there was a Taliban hit team that it was assigned to kill him. There was a bounty on his head. And he asked if I would sponsor him for, at that point, this newly created visa program called the Special Immigration Visa. I, I said, sure, naively thinking it would take maybe six months, a year to get him his visa. And it ended up taking a heck of a lot more. Um, about four years of advocacy, a lot of congressional in interaction, and then ultimately a public advocacy campaign conducted in the media. Um, through that effort, we were successful. Um, I learned just how hard it is to get people over here. And then I learned firsthand just how difficult it is for them to start their new lives. Thank you, Matt, for sharing that incredibly personal and poignant story. Um, so Lee, I'm gonna turn to you to talk a little bit about policy and programs. Lee, can you tell us about the special immigrant visa SIV program? Um, how are SIVs resettled in the U.S.? And could you talk us, uh, to us a little bit about the current backlog within the SIV program? Sure, happy to do so. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, good afternoon. So over the past 15 years, the U.S. government has established four special immigrant visa programs to protect Iraqi and Afghan partners. And the first uh, was established by Congress in 2006 under Section 1059 of the National Defense Authorization Act. And that section authorized the issuance of up to 50 special immigrant visas annually to protect Iraqi and Afghan and translators and interpreters who were working for the US military and who met certain conditions. Congress authorized the second SIV program for Iraqis under the National Defense Authorization Act of 2008. And that provided protection for Iraqi employees of the US government um, so from 2008 to 2014, uh, when that program was closed to new applications from Iraqis. Subsequently, uh, the direct access program was established to allow Iraqis with U.S. affiliations to apply for refugee status in the U.S. So that's the third program. And then finally, in 2009, Congress passed the Afghan Allies Protection Act, which established special immigrant visas for Afghan na nationals. And each of these programs operates separately from the U.S. Refugee Admissions Program, but, but as we'll discuss in just a minute, um, SIV holders are entitled to uh, benefits and services offered through the U.S. RAP. In terms of the, the process that uh, an applicant goes through, uh, the, the process to obtain a, a special immigrant visa is rigorous and it's complex. It comprises 14 steps and involves multiple agencies within the federal government. Uh, the first step entails the applicant filing a petition with the United States Customs and Immigration Service, uh, also, also known as USCIS. And through this process, the applicants must submit a package of documentation, uh, including a special immigrant uh, petition form known as the I-360, proof of Iraqi or Afghan nationality, proof that they worked alongside uh, US forces or under the chief of mission, uh, proof of a background check uh, and screening by the U.S. Armed Forces or the Chief of Mission, uh, as well as recommend letters of recommendation. Um, these candidates are, are thoroughly vetted by a number of U.S. federal security agencies throughout this process. And once USCIS has reviewed and approved the application, it notifies the National Visa Center and forwards uh, the, the approved petition. The National Visa Center then contacts the applicants to advise them to begin collecting additional data, uh, additional documentation to move forward with the visa application. Uh, it, the NVC also schedules an in-person immigrant visa interview for the applicant and their families at a U.S. Embassy or consulate overseas. 
So this process should take about nine months, but as Matt mentioned, uh, and unfortunately is the norm, uh, the current process takes between two and five years for visa issuance. And there are several factors contributing to this backlog, including, again, the complex vetting process, you know, a lot of the anti-immigrant policies implemented during the previous administration, and, and as well, uh, the impact of the pandemic in terms of visa uh, processing. And according to IRAP, or the International Refugee Assistance Project, and as Chris mentioned, there are 17,000 Afghans currently in the processing pipeline. And when we take into account their families, their spouses, and un unmarried children under 21, that number gets closer to 70,000 people who are waiting to be processed. Now, once the visa has been issued, SIV recipients are entitled to receive the same benefits and services offered to participants of the US Refugee Admissions Program. Uh, special immigrant uh, visa holders that have to apply for these benefits before they depart for the United States. Uh, to get to the US, they can either have their travel booked through the International Organization for Migration, or IOM, or if there's an urgent need for travel, they can book travel uh, on their own uh, to come to the US. Uh, once the visa holders get here, uh, again, the they are eligible to receive reception and placement benefits, and that's the U.S. Uh, Refugee Resettlement Program's initial program that helps with housing, uh, helps with employment, getting kids in school, et cetera. Um, and they work with the local resettlement agencies in whatever their resettlement location of choice is. Um, one major distinction I just want to point out between SIV holders and people who come through the U.S. Refugee Admissions Program is that uh, SIV holders are automatically eligible for a green card, whereas refugees must wait a year before adjusting their status. Great. Uh, Lee, thank you so much for that very comprehensive summary. Um, so I think we've heard from Matt why these individuals who have risked their lives um, are so uh, deserving and need our protection. And I think from Lee, we've heard how important uh, this program is and how there is a pathway um, to allow for uh, their arrival here in the United States ultimately. Um, so Suzanne, I wanna ask you the, the final question that I'm gonna ask before we go to audience Q&A. Um, so what are some of the next steps that the Biden administration needs to take in order to protect Afghan allies and how can our audience members be advocates for our allies? Certainly, thank, thank you so much for the question. Um, first, I'll say that LRS has uh, led to letters uh, on this issue to President Biden uh, with regard to the evacuation of Afghan allies, one on May 12th and another on June 4th, the latter letter to, to President Biden being co-signed by almost 70 other NGOs uh, calling for the same action. Since then, uh, the Pentagon has made multiple public statements, notably from the Joint Chiefs Chairman, denoting the Pentagon's ability to execute an evacuation of Afghan allies once the President directs them to do so. Uh, Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin has tasked the head of U.S. Central Command to develop options for, the, for those Afghans that include the possibility of evacuating them. And we've also seen that the rescue of Afghan allies has been championed by bipartisan cohort of senators and Congress members, a particularly unique phenomenon in the current Congress. And these legislators have publicly called on the president to order an evacuation of American affiliated Afghans that are in imminent risk. Um, they sent a letter from Republican and Democratic House members to the president to that effect last Friday. Uh, on the same day, LRS submitted our 70 plus organizational letter. Um, their letter in line with our advocacy points out that the current average processing time for SIV applicants is 800 days. U.S. forces are withdrawing from Afghanistan next month. There was a window in which improvements to the SIV application processing system alone could save these lives, but that window is closed and it's time for President Biden to use available executive authority, assets, and his own officials familiarity with previous evacuation of allies to get these folks to safety. We, along with the majority of leading advocates on this, are recommending an evacuation to the American territory of Guam. Guam was used to stage the evacuation of Vietnamese refugees after the fall of Saigon in 1975, while their visas were, were processed. In 1996, Guam also served as a temporary haven for Kurds who had worked with USA groups in North Iraq. Um, Guam's local government, intimately familiar with how their territory has hosted US allies evacuees in the past, has publicly said, 
that they would welcome the safe evacuation of Afghan allies to their territory. So the path forward of the life-saving evacuation of Afghan SIVs and their family is apparent. It is to President Biden to make the essential step, step to take down that path. Um, as people advocates faithfully called to care for American aff affiliated Afghans, we ask that you do two things. First, um, send a letter uh, send a message to President Biden calling for the emergency evacuation of these Afghan allies. Um, we will share a link that allows you to customize a message to President Biden. We have had almost 900 personal messages customized uh, to the White House calling on um, them to do just that. And then second, second action that I would ask is to tweet your senators and Congress members under the hashtag keep our promise, urging an emergency evacuation for Afghan allies. We have a lot of partners in Congress and they have been sending and putting pressure um, on the White House and we need to keep that up. So these are the two action items we would ask for you and thank you so much for whatever you can do. Okay, wonderful, um, very helpful. And Susanna, you preempted uh, one of the audience questions that I was gonna direct um, from Robert who said, what do you need from us? So Robert, hopefully that answered the question. If you have a follow-up, um, if either of those two actions was less than clear, please um, you know, shoot us another question and I can pose it to the panelists. Um, so I'll start with a question from David who asks, are we assuming that all of our Afghan allies want to enter the US or have they all actually said they want to leave their home country? Um, so Matt, do you wanna take that question initially? Sure, happy to. Um, the, the answer is, yeah. I, 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 uh, the Taliban really make no distinction uh, uh, in, in compared to how we do in terms of who they're gonna kill versus who we give a visa to, right? So we, we have very strict criteria for how you have to earn a visa. You had to have given, for example, 24 cumulative months of service. And someone like me in uniform has to have deemed that service as both honorable and provide uh, as both honorable and valuable. Um, the Taliban really don't care. If you, if you gave a day, they're going to kill you. And they have a very North Korean sensibility about it. They're going to kill you and every member of their, your family that they can get their hands on. They're likely going to kill them in front of you as well. And they'll film it. And then they're going to release that film onto the internet for the sole purpose of not trying to shock our American audience but really to try to convince future people that Americans ask to befriend and become allies, that this is the cost of American friendship. The price is death for you and your family. And again, when I, you know, my remarks, I always start off by saying I shouldn't be here. That is the absolute truth. The reason I am is because an Afghan man chose to serve with us. He had a number of reasons he did it. You know, in, in addition to believing that the Taliban and Al Qaeda are a virus of evil, that he felt compelled to try to help eradicate, he also believed that we were honorable people who kept our word. So when you ask, are there any Afghans that really, you know, the Afghans want this? I I've lost count. I get pinged pretty much constantly on my phone as do a lot of the people on this, this presentation because of the nature of the work that we do by people who are currently overseas right now, looking to us to ensure that we're gonna keep this promise. And to a person, they're terrified. They are terrified that they know what comes if we fail to keep it. Um, this isn't the 1980s. There, a lot of people seem to think, well, maybe they can escape over land to, to places like Pakistan or Tajikistan or Iran. It's not the case anymore. There's, there are fences, li literally enclose all of Afghanistan. Um, that once we leave, the likelihood is that the Turkish military are going to pull their um, forces that currently guard the major airport in Kabul. And should that occur, commercial flights probably won't be flying to and, F and from Afghanistan much longer. So an air evac route that is not conducted by military forces is not probably going to be possible in, the co in just a couple of weeks. It's, it's really now or never. This is a never again moment in the making that we have every possible means of being able to prevent. We, we did the, the, the numbers on this. If I can just briefly share my screen, because I want to I wanna show people just how easy a Guam option actually looks like here. So um, if you take a look here, this is just what we did was we, we took all the various um, planes that you can see sort of towards the bottom. 
that could possibly be used in an, an evacuation, C-17, C-5s, Boeing 777s, et cetera. We came up with the average number of people on, on each of those flights. It, it works out to about 227 people. And then we took just what we call the devil's arithmetic, the number of currently known applicants, which is around 18,000 people. You multiply it by the average number of people that come with them. That's usually about three people per, per applicant. That gets you an additional 53,000 family members for a total of around 71,000 people. You then take that number by the you know, 71,000 people and you divide it by the average number of people you can put on each flight and you get around 313 flights that we need to, to do to get this, to get airlift, which is essentially an NFL stadium's worth of people out of Afghanistan to another location. Um, if we have to the 4th of July, which is the projected withdrawal date, we have to be averaging at least now 12 flights a day. Um, if we have to the 11th of September, it's around four flights a day. It's a little bit more manageable. You, if you wonder what the cost of all of this is, you'll see down here what we projected is it's around an additional 8.3 hours of the total DOD budget. Well, how do we get to that? There were three previous operations that were done historically um, that moved people from other locations, either to Guam or in one instance, the, the Kosovo operation to Fort Dix, New Jersey. We came up with the average cost of those three operations combined to try to give us a projected cost of this Afghan operation. And it works out to about $10,000 per person. Now that cost includes the cost of flying them from Afghanistan to Guam, housing them temporarily on Guam, processing their visa, and then moving them back to the United States for a total cost of around $700 million. So again, that's about 8.3 additional hours of the DOD budget, which I think is a heck of a down payment on ensuring that we have allies in the future and it shows that the American people keep their word. But here's the challenge that befalls us. We, we put out a daily tracker through an organization called the Association of Wartime Allies. You can follow us on, on Twitter at Wartime Allies. We put this out every day. And you can see that it, it, as this, this graph down here shows how it's going to get exponentially more difficult as we approach that July deadline. Um, it, the reality is I've, it, we've, been, is we've been posting this daily. That July 4th number, it only took two days to go from 12 to 13 flights a day. It's going to take about a day now to go from 13 to 14. And then going forward, it's about two flights a day, three flights a day with each passing day. So we, we have very little limited time to do this. We have all of the resources to do it. There's massive bipartisan support in Congress. There's now a huge coalition of human rights organizations that are being led by, by your organization. Uh, the only person missing in action is the president. That, that's what I can't figure out is an, organ, it is an administration that touts itself as a champion and defender of human rights has a coming human rights fiasco that is going, it's gonna be something that they own, right? The Obama administration, the Trump administration in particular, owns the failure of the SIV program having not worked sufficiently in its years of existence. But if we don't save these people, that is going to be entirely on this president. And I, I, it boggles my mind why we haven't heard anything yet. Thank you, Matt, for that incredibly compelling um, lesson, both in terms of how simple the arithmetic um, could, could make it. Uh, be a viable solution, but how quickly that arith arithmetic will get very hard. Uh, for people... folks looking for it, by the way, because um, I, I see people posting in the chat, um, the Truman Project posted this study. You can just Google Truman SIV and it will come right up. Uh, and then the Association of Wartime Allies puts out that tracker every day on Twitter and social media. Yeah, it's a, it's a great resource. So thank you for um, helping to develop that. Um, so one question we got from David was, if our Afghan allies go to Guam first, will the extensive vetting process be completed there before they go uh, to mainland US? So Lee, do you wanna first take a crack at that? Sure, yeah. I mean, in past airlifts, that's exactly what happened is that uh, in essence, you know, Guam is US territory, but, uh, and I am not a lawyer, but having them there as opposed to in the, 50 United States uh, allows for the vetting process to uh, take place and for their entry in as immigrants. So uh, we have done it before, and um, I would assume that the the um, security vetting would be expedited potentially, but would still continue to to happen as as planned. Great. Um, our next question comes from Teresa. Uh, where would these Afghan 
refugees be relocated to in the United States? Are they looking for somewhere that is like Afghanistan? Our West is similar and many places are losing population and looking for new community members. They go everywhere. They go to my hometown of Rochester, New York. They go to places like Sacramento. They come to Northern Virginia, which is where I currently live. Um, the reality is we've actually helped, well, you know, our country has welcomed around 30,000 or so Afghans since 2009. Uh, and um, they have, for the most part as a diaspora, done very well for themselves. Um, they've been welcomed uh, into the communities around them. They're now very proud Americans. Many of them have already gained their citizenship that the gentleman who saved my life voted for the first time in the last election, which was really cool to help him to, to do and, and, and behold. Uh, and if you met his kids, you would have no idea that they weren't born here. Um, you know, they're as American as my, my, my daughter and they play with my kids as their cousins. Uh, that's how close a lot of these families get to become to the American families that, that to come to know them and adopt them. And I encourage anybody watching, Lutheran does an amazing job resettling um, these folks. You, you should definitely get involved the, um, and, and try to just, you know, adopt a, you know, get involved in any way you can. But if you ever get to the point where you get to adopt a family and like work with them one on one, it, it really is just incredible uh, and moving. Great. Um, next question uh, is is just a clarification um, from Jonathan. Did I hear correctly that there are only fifty special immigrant visas? available to US military partners annually, and that it takes two to five years to get one processed. So that was through the, the first of the SIV programs for, for interpreters and translators. The, the, the ensuing uh, programs expanded the number of the annual visas uh, for, for Afghans through the, uh, for the, through the program. So that's just one component. There are actually two different pools of, of visas. Great. And then um, a related question um, that maybe Lee or Susanna could answer um, from Elisa. Can you share numbers in the pipeline of applicants and their families? Is that the same number of those who would need to be evacuated? So um, I'll take this one, which is uh, there are, as, as far as we know right now, there are an estimate to either 17,000 or 18,000 uh, uh, applications, SIV applications currently outstanding in the pipeline. Um, there is an allocation of 12,000 that could be um, that could be processed this year theoretically in in a, an, in a different world, not the one that we're in right now. Fis the fiscal year 2021 ends uh, ends very soon. It ends in the fall, and uh, we've only processed 2,200 Afghan SIVs. So there are a number of applications around uh, 17 to 18,000 that we we believe exists in the pipeline and their family members, which are estimated to be about 53,000. So you're looking at an evacuation um, to Guam of 70,000 individuals to safety where their uh, applications can be processed expeditiously. I hope that answers the question. Great, um, and another question on the numbers, appreciate our audience for really digging in to clarify exactly what the situation is. From Michael, how many SIV applicants can Guam handle? And how long do you expect they would have to wait there for final clearance to the US. I got this one because I talk to the people on Guam regularly. In fact, uh, in about three hours, I'm going to be talking to the Guamanian government. Um, they're 14 hours ahead of us. Uh, so um, the people on Guam really want this to happen. Uh, the governor has publicly endorsed it, as has their member of Congress, who is a, a me member by the name of delegates. I think it's San Nicolas or San Nichols. I, I can't remember his exact name, but um, the um, the Guam economy is dependent on tourism and COVID essentially wiped that out. Um, Guam's unemployment rate currently sits above 20% and most of its hotels currently sit vacant. Um, we've talked to the Guam Chamber of Commerce as well as the Guam Hotel Owners Association. There seems to be consensus across the island that the best place to house these people would be in their empty hotels. Uh, in so doing, it would put a lot of the, uh, um, the workers on the island back to work. Guam's un uh, federal unemployment assistance runs out in September. They've had it since the beginning of COVID. And they're terrified that once it runs out, the island is going to essentially be without an economy and that their tourism is not projected to rebound until 2024. So we've got a, we have a, a sort of a win-win a here, right? We've got an economy that needs people. We have people that are in need of housing. We have a bunch of hotels that are currently sitting vacant. And 
everybody involved seems to want to do this. You know, Guam has a proud tradition of welcoming refugees. Um, the, the, the next thing is, well, how long would they sit there? In reality, we think that most of the people in Guam would be there for a couple of weeks, um, that the vast majority of the cases could be expedited and processed um, with just a little bit more screening time. Um, we just don't have the time for them to be waiting while that for that to occur while they're in Afghanistan. Every day that we leave them in Afghanistan is a gift to the Taliban. That's what you need to be thinking about right now. Um, whereas, again, Guam's a paradise, <laughs> comparatively speaking. A lot of these people will be their first time to the beach. And having taken my Afghan brother to the ocean for the first time, I can tell you that one of life's pleasures is watching somebody who's never seen an ocean before see it for the first time. It really is just a special experience. Multiply that by 70,000 and Guam's gonna be a really magical place for the next couple of months. Um, so I have two questions that are somewhat related. So I'm gonna lump them together. One's from Lamia. Would it help to start a database of willing sponsors to house these evacuees? Um, so maybe kind of related to that question of what, what is the housing gonna look like? And then another question, is uh, for those of us who are assisting with SIV paperwork, is there any reason to continue? Is there any processing actually taking place now? In terms of the housing, um, again, all of the all of the special immigrant visa holders when they get to the United States are eligible for the same benefits as somebody coming through the U.S. Refugee Admissions Program, which is heavily dependent on um, on volunteers to assist the, the local agencies. I mean, it's it's a public-private partnership, and the only way that successful resettlement happens is through community and volunteer engagement. So. Uh, absolutely, there will be need for volunteers. There'll be a need for assistance with housing. There'll be a lot of uh, a lot of various needs to help these uh, folks when they get to the United States. Great. All right. Um, our next question comes um, from Anne. The previous, the three previous evacuations mentioned were all before 9/11. Um, since that time, moving large numbers of unvetted to the U.S. has been a non-starter. How can we get around this issue? Um, I, I, I'll take a, a crack at it and then I'd love to, to hand it to Matt for a second. Um, I'll just say that um, those who go through the uh, SIV application process uh, are vetted and, and I, you're not going to find a lot of refugee resettlement advocates who are going to say that we want to stop vetting. Um, we're big, we, for procedural reasons, we believe in it. Um, uh, the evacuation of Afghan allies to Guam would not be uh, expediting, skipping, or, or in any way affecting the, the vetting process. Most of the holdups in the application process are on, not related to security, security vetting. They're related to employment conf confirmation or bureaucratic issues. So um, that would continue uh, and would not affect it um, in the way that, you know, 52 national security leaders have plus have, have come out, cabinet level officials have come out and said that they, they have confidence in the refugee program's vetting. So um, that isn't so much an issue, but Matt, I don't know if you have any further thoughts on that. I've had Mitch McConnell's national security advisor personally tell me that the special immigration visa program is what he and his fellow um, adherents of this worldview consider to be the gold standard when it comes to extreme vetting of individuals trying to make it to the United States. And that if they could, they'd apply the SIV programs a security screening um, criteria to every single immigrant that came to the U.S. Um, I, I, there's never been an SIV um, admitted into the United States that has in any way ever been a security threat. No one's ever been arrested, tried, convicted, detained, suspected of any type of support to any nefarious organization. Many of these people come to the U.S. and end up joining our military and, and go back in uniform to continue serving not only our country, but their country as well. Um, their country of origin, I should say. Um, all of this is to say, um, Susanna's right, the, the biggest holdups in the SIV program are often employment verification. And, and I can give you my favorite example. Um, there's a podcast that we do every week called Wartime Allies. And this last week, we interviewed this, this engineer who we we'll call him Abdul. It's not his real name. Abdul served for 12 years uh, with US forces in, in various capacities. Um, at one point, he was demining roads. Uh, he built power plants, water treatment facilities, et cetera. 
his employer has already verified his, his employment to the State Department, but for whatever reason, the State Department felt that five years after the, he'd first verified this gentleman's employment, he needed to re-verify his visa, uh, or re-verify the employment, and that's the only way that this gentleman can get his visa is if this one guy who he hasn't spoken to in five years writes a letter saying, yes, the information I told you five years before is still true. I still recommend him for a visa. Well, that's annoying, right? It's kind of hard if you're on the other side of the world to track someone that you haven't seen in five years down, but maybe, all right, fine, this guy really wants to get out alive. He's got to do that. Well, the problem is that this gentleman's American supervisor is currently held hostage by the Taliban. State Department knows this. The FBI knows it. There's a $5 million reward for his return. He can't re-verify his employment. And yet, even though state knows the guy's held hostage by the Taliban, they refuse to issue him his visa until this one person submits verification on this. Now, that is an extreme example, but I, 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 unfortunately, that, that, that type of BS is, plagues the system, and it's that type of red tape that um, these people are often held up by and why it ends up taking four or five years on average to get someone their visa. Um, so, you know, it's a great question. We haven't moved these many people since 9-11, but we're, we also had 15 years to get this right and we didn't. So this is the consequence for not having properly administered this program. And we as Americans now all own that. The question becomes, what's worse? Do we wanna sit back and own a, gen you know, a mass murder that we get to bear witness to, or do we wanna actually have tried to prevent it? I'd say let's try and prevent it. Thank you, Matt, for using you know an extreme example. But if, uh, to me, that reflects what I think many of us know, which is that this is a system that is broken. And unless we do something extreme, we will be endangering uh, these individuals and their families' lives. Um, and we will do it with full knowledge of, of the repercussions of, of what, um, what is to come. So the final um, few questions, I'm going to ask them all together. Um, and open it up uh, to the panelists for sort of closing comments. Um, they, they're similar um, in terms of kind of how do we uh, force action? Um, the question I regularly get is, this seems like a no brainer. Who disagrees with this? Um, you know, Matt, your comment about Mitch McConnell's uh, staffer, I think reflects um, the fact that there is consensus, there's bipartisan agreement here. Um, so the questions we are getting are um, one, uh, can DOD support or pressure make a difference in ensuring these allies are not forgotten? Um, we have Christine who wrote that she's actually contacted her members of Congress um, and sent a message to Biden through the LIRS site. Christine, thank you for doing that. Should I contact the White House again? Is there anything else that I can do? Um, I think really the question is, how do we uh, make sure that President Biden and our nation keep their promise? So um, I'll, I'll answer Anne's question to just start and say, um, the Pentagon doesn't traditionally engage in too much advocacy, um, but in terms of Afghan SIVs, they have done about gone about as far as they go. Uh, and they, I mean, the comments I made before from the Joint Chiefs Chairman, um, from Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin, them saying publicly that they're ready and willing and capable uh, as soon as they get the dir directive to do so, that's uh, advocacy as far as the Pentagon goes. So they have already put public pressure in terms of letting the media know that the holdup isn't on uh, the defense side. Um, so there's that. Um, and I'll let folks answer some of the other questions. I get what you're saying. DOD fully supports this. They, they completely get right that they would be the ones that would be asked to fight the the brunt of America's future wars and that they're, you know, we all want to prevent fewer casualties in future wars and how we do that is by having friends and allies work alongside us. Um, the major holdup here seems to be the political folks in the White House. And what we've heard is that they, they seem to have more of a concern about the optics of an evacuation than the optics of mass murder. I, I it boggles my mind. So look, I, um, to, to Chris's point, the, in terms of bipartisan support, the letter that was released by the Senate to the president urging them to evacuate our Afghan allies out of Afghanistan had the signatures of both Patrick Leahy of Vermont and Ron, the last presidential election wasn't valid, Johnson of Wisconsin. I don't know of an issue in which these two gentlemen agree. I can't find another one in which they're jointly on the same letter, except for this. That ought to tell you how bipartisan this is. The holdup is the White House. 
um, the holdup is the president. So if you if you if anyone has a, me a means of getting a message to Biden, that seems to be what what's gonna it's gonna take is there's one individual on the planet that can give the order to do this. There's one individual with the authority to get this done, and they're completely missing in action right now. Well, that's where I think that we all should have um, some hope because. This isn't about navigating a minefield uh, to get this across the finish line. There is one individual in a White House um, of people that I think many of us know uh, have had conversations with who care about this issue. Um, when the refugee resettlement number wasn't increased, uh, we all raised our voices in unison and that was reversed. So I have confidence that you know the fact that you all are joining this conversation, um, that you have uh, you know, mouthpieces, microphones that you can use, um, that we still can get this done. So with that, I will hand it over to Kristen, um, but just end by saying thank you to all the panelists for sharing your incredibly helpful perspective, personal experience, and expertise. Thank you, Krish. As you know, often we hear about these situations when it's too late. We often hear about them and say, I can't believe that that happened. This is the moment. This is the moment where we have the opportunity to clearly uphold the dignity of the human person. This is the moment where people of faith understand the core belief of human dignity. And we have to live it morally and ethically. This is a moment in our country's history where we are being challenged as to whether or not we live the beliefs we say we live. LIRS has compiled a toolkit to make sure that you can take the wisdom of this presentation and you can share it with others. We ask you to not hold this truth to yourself. Truth must be shared. And in order to do that, we invite you to post on social media. We invite you to take that action, to encourage others to take action. Send to your family, your friends, the information that will be sent to you because you registered for this website. You'll be receiving a follow-up that outlines the options of getting involved. Please don't be neutral. Neutrality is siding with those who are allowing this horrific action to take place. Stand and stand with strength. Act, use your advocacy, donate, be it monthly or once, Please help LIRS provide intensive support to newly arrived refugees and to empower new Americans to become successful and to become contributing members of their communities. This is a moment where we can shine. This is a moment where we can do more. Stand up, be counted. As Susanna named, we need to speak directly to those who run our country and say, we elected you and we elected you to hold true to the values that we hold dear. We invite you to pray together. In the toolkit, there's interfaith prayer so that you can pray with your Afghan brothers and sisters together so that we are lifting up our voice as one unit. And there is also a prayer for Christian faith and prayers for the people to include in worship. Please lift your voices. We make sure in these downloadable pieces that you can share with friends who haven't had the opportunity to be a part of this webinar. We included a story about a gentleman named Mohammed and what the SIV program meant to him, what it means to his family. We ask you to carry this forward. Teach others. Don't let this sit with you being upset I know I'm coming out of this webinar in passion and I wanna help Matt and I wanna help all of these people. So do something. God has given you that opportunity. We invite you to take it. Thank you, Kristen. And thank you to everyone who's joined us for this important conversation. Our shared advocacy efforts are making a difference. And LIRS is uniquely positioned as a leader in refugee resettlement and advocacy, which is completely funded through our private donations. We invite you to invest in these efforts so that we can continue to advocate for our Afghan allies and all immigrants and refugees seeking welcome. To make a gift today, visit LIRS.org LIRS slash give. 
And as a reminder, please do share the recording of this webinar, the toolkit, and other resources that you'll be receiving in the follow-up email. From all of us at LIRS, thanks again for tuning in. We look forward to seeing you again soon. Take good care and keep up the fight.